change is the bi biggest global crisis ever to face us, and it will drag down uh, species into extinction. It will change whole ecosystems uh, as the planet warms up. It's human caused. It's got incredible scientific consensus behind it, and uh, it will take massive changes in the structure of societies across the world. Uh, to be able to slow it down. It's beyond the tipping point where we probably can't stop it any longer. Uh, Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guest is Karen Coulter. Karen has served on the board of POCLAD, the Program on Corporations, Law and Democracy, which was formed during the 1990s to start democratic conversations and actions that contest the authority of corporations to govern. More on POCLAD is available on their website, www.poclad.org. Karen is also founder and director of the, or of the Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project. Today, she joins us to talk about the Earth First movement. By way of introduction, let me read from the Earth First website. Are you tired of namby-pamby environmental groups? Mm -hmm. Are you tired of overpaid corporate environments? environmentalists who suck up to bureaucrats in the industry? Have you become disempowered by the reductionist approach of environmental professionals and scientists? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Earth First is for you. Earth First is effective. Our frontline direct action approach to protecting wild wilderness gets results. We have succeeded in cases where other environmental groups have given up and have drawn public attention to the crisis facing the natural world. Karen was one of our early guests, so we want to welcome Karen back to the Thank Populist you. Dialogues. It's great to be here. Great, good, yeah. So you have um, a presentation you'd like to do about mm -hmm. the first uh, Earth First Movement, so I'm just going to let okay. you go ahead. Yeah, let's start with that. Yeah. So the Earth First Movement uh, began in 1980 as a non-compromising alternative to large mainstream environmental organizations who were selling out our last roadless areas to logging and roading, and they were cutting a deal with politicians to only protect a small percentage of these roadless areas, even though at the time I was out on the streets in Portland, Oregon, and found that the vast majority of the public wanted all of them saved. So uh, Earth First, um, is a populist revolt that became a movement with its own culture of music, art, poetry, and street theater right away. The Earth First movement's also characterized by its emphasis on direct action. Here's their first civil disobedience blockade of the Bald Mountain Road in Southern Oregon, which prevented the logging of a wild roadless area. Earth First does not organize ecological sabotage, but has developed an ethic that does not condemn it, considering sabotage of machinery not to be violence against any living thing if done properly. And an Earth First co-founder, Dave Foreman, edited a book called Eco Defense, A Guide to Ecological Sabotage. Here is Earth First art depicting a woman dismantling a bulldozer in the middle of the night. Earth First is a biocentric movement focusing on the rights of all species to flourish, not just humans. Here a beaver is depicted as having felled a tree that took out a truck representative of the natural resource extraction industry. And this is a rally protecting the logging of the redwood forests in California and shows the movement's use of music to generate enthusiasm. Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney, the musicians pictured here, were car bombed, which severely injured Judy, but they later won a precedent-setting lawsuit against the FBI for violating their civil rights by trying to frame them as the bombers. The iconic symbolic cracking of the Glen Canyon Dam in Arizona showed the Earth First Movement willingness to step outside the bounds of presumed political reality and agitate for restoration of lost ecosystems. As a consequence, rewilding of dams like the Elwha is now happening, where the dams are actually being dismantled to restore lost, lost fish runs and river ecology. This is a picture of the Elwha Dam. Tree sits became a popular way to occupy logging sites and alert the public and media to the loss of our, our forests. Here's a tree sitter prepared to live in the threatened trees. 
Direct action blockades began to use more sophisticated technical lockdown devices such as these straight and angled metal lock boxes around the blockader's arms to make it harder to remove them and perpetuate the blockade longer. Concrete filled barrels and in this case tree sections were used to make it easier to block a wide space such as a road with fewer people. Protesters arms are locked to metal pins inside. Trey Arrow, pictured here, occupied a narrow ledge in downtown Portland for days outside the Regional Forest Service office to protest the logging of the Eagle Creek timber sale area, which was finally saved after a long campaign. This is a tripod occupied by a protester to block a Portland intersection, bringing the forest protection message to the city. This rally of thousands of people to protect the logging of the Redwoods is the result of extensive public outreach and organizing by Northern California Earth Firsters. Here's an elaborate blockade to stop the logging and roading of the Cove Mallard timber sales in the largest roadless area in the lower 48 states. After a seven year campaign, most of the timber sales and roading were stopped. And then the Warner Creek blockade near Oak Ridge, Oregon persisted through the winter over a year and a half to stop the logging of wildfire burned forests, which mainstream environmentalists thought were impossible to stop. Yet the blockade lasted and stopped the logging along with public education efforts benefiting biodiversity dependent on burned forests. This is a Florida Earth First blockade against ecological destruction by Florida Power and Light Corporation that stopped traffic for miles. Here's another blockade stopping logging from a large post-fire timber sale, the Biscuit Sale in southwestern Oregon. Here a person is locked down to the undercarriage of a sacrifice truck. The blockade of the bridge accessing the same timber sale is constructed of a log across the bridge in a cantilever arrangement anchored by a person in a platform hanging over the river. And here's a view of how the person is suspended, so if law enforcement cut the log to open the bridge, the protester would fall f far below into the shallow river. Even grandmothers have participated in Earth First blockades. This is Joan Norman blocking the same bridge by herself. Earth First is also often found common cause with Native people here in solidarity with the Apache people to prot protest the desecration of a sacred mountain in Arizona which was threatened with an astronomy telescope development. Earth First has also brought little known ecological issues to public attention, such as the Park Service's slaughter of the Yellowstone buffalo as they leave the national park to forage on ancestral grazing mi migrations. Women have moved to the forefront of the Earth First movement, which has always had strong women leaders, but used to have a more macho culture. The Earth First movement spread to many other countries, including New Zealand, pictured here with a charismatic tripod blockade of logging by an angel. Earth First is a movement, not an organization, and has engaged successfully with other movements such as the anti-global corporatization movement. This is such a joint effort, the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle in 1999. Billboard alteration has been a well-used tactic to reclaim the story of what's really happening. Earth Firsters have been instrumental in res resisting mountaintop removal for coal, as with this 2005 Katua Earth First action to stop mountaintop mining destruction of rivers, streams, and forests in Appalachia. This is an Earth First blockade of a bridge leading to a coal-fired power plant in Virginia, which was created by deflating the tires of a loaded coal truck once it got onto the bridge. This is a mega load of equipment for tar sand strip mining, which clear cuts boreal forests, poisons local indigenous communities and wildlife, and creates the world's most concentrated source of greenhouse gases contributing to climate change. Earth First has joined other groups and movements such as the Indigenous Environmental Network pic pictured here to protest tar sands mining. The Earth First movement has cultivated a community of mutual aid and solidarity and resistance. The Earth First movement is still alive. This is a recent Earth First uh, tree sit in, uh, by Everglades Earth First, one of the last large intact uh, it's the tree set of one of the last larger intact native forests in Palm Beach County, Florida, which has been slated for development into a biotechnology city by the Scripps Institute. 
The tree sit generated primetime media coverage of the issue for a month and a half, and so far the forest is still standing. I want to emphasize that this is a public movement open to those who believe other species have a right to exist for their own sake and that wilderness must be protected and restored. And there's currently Earth First groups in 14 states, the District of Columbia, and five other countries, plus closely allied groups in four other states and seven other countries. Great, good, thank you very much. I uh, was reading that the city of uh, Santa Monica, California recently passed an ordinance guaranteeing the rights of nature in mm -hmm. the city itself. I thought that was a pretty exciting uh, development. And that's a very biocentric development. That's the kind of uh -huh. thing that Earth Firsters really love. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so t t t tell me, how has the Earth First movement changed over time? The Earth First movement has changed by growing, for one thing, to expand to other states and other countries. Within the first five years, there were, there were eight groups established in the U.S. due to a road show in, with 40 stops. And it's also changed by diversifying. It's now much more inclusive of women, people of color, gays, lesbians, transgender, bisexual people, uh, much more diverse than it began. And then the other major change has been an expansion of the focus from just strictly wilderness preservation and restoration to include other issues such as social inequities that underlie a lot of ecological problems and climate change, which is an overarching global problem. Right, yeah, okay, good. Uh, and, and has, has it, has the has the world changed enough or not enough that we still need the Earth First movement today? We definitely need the Earth First movement. I'm very concerned that it's the only biocentric movement outside of indigenous rights and indigenous movements uh, that's out there. And we all depend on the Earth. Um, that's rather basic. Uh, so the Earth and its Bio biospheres and ecosystems has to be considered as a priority over social and economic systems because it's the basis of all life. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned that that kind of uh, perspective is perpetuated. Uh, yeah, we certainly need that, that, that focus. Um, the, the guest we had on uh, last week uh, was talking about uh, how the fossil fuel industries have uh, created this bubble of natural gas mm -hmm. uh, and how that is going to destroy all of the renewable energy uh, initiatives. Uh, so having that focus and realizing that um, we all live in this world, we mm -hmm. all need this world and we need to protect it, and that is foremost beyond the economic um, yeah. uh, that perspective definitely needs to be out there. Yeah, we need Earth First more now than ever. We're on the brink of global crisis and disaster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, can you talk about uh, a little bit more about how you see that global uh, crisis and disaster? Well, climate change is the bi biggest global crisis ever to face us, and it will drag down uh, species into extinction. It will change whole ecosystems uh, as the planet warms up. It's human caused, it's got incredible scientific consensus behind it, and uh, it will take massive changes in the structure of societies across the world uh, to be able to slow it down. It's beyond the tipping point where we probably can't stop it any longer. Uh, but Earth Firsters have been targeting hydrofracking, uh, coal export, coal production, all kinds of sources, including deforestation of climate change. And it will take a lot of strong action and a lot of will, political will, which seems to be lacking, uh, to change this. So it's going to take a grassroots movement to do it. Mm -hmm. And have you been involved in the efforts to uh, not develop liquid natural gas terminals for export of natural gas and, and against the tar sands developments in, in Canada? There's Earth Firsters right now um, protesting the, and trying to block the Keystone XL pipeline in Texas and uh, who've been block, trying to block hydrofracking and uh, coal production uh, across, across the country. Uh, there's Earth First groups in s states. W Earth First was one of the first groups to resist mountaintop removal along with local people. 
Um, and there's been a lot of spin-off groups from Earth First, such as Rising Tide, which directly addresses climate change. So there's been very heavy involvement from Earth First in mm -hmm. this. Uh, and Rising Tide is, uh, I've heard of them, is, is that just a Portland? No, it's, a a it's uh, actually international. International, yeah. oh, okay. Can, can you describe that? Yeah, it started, it started in the UK, but it's, uh, like Earth First, it's more of a movement than an organization. There aren't paid staff, it's volunteer-based, mm -hmm. and it does employ direct action uh, to try to meet its goals as well as encouraging people to become part with a lot of uh, easy street theater and things like that to mm -hmm. get people involved. Okay. Do, do you know if, if there's um, groups in, the or in Oregon or in yeah, Portland? Yeah, there's, there's a rising tide group here in Portland. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought I had heard mm -hmm. of that. Okay, good, good. Um, so wh wh why, why is it important to remember this history? Well, there's a saying that uh, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Conversely, those who forget their our story, their story of resistance, are doomed not to learn from it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to celebrate our resistance movements and to learn from them as much as possible. And in the course of preparing these Earth First history presentations, I learned that the Earth First movement was far more successful over the long run than I thought. And I also saw where the pitfalls are to some extent and where the victories were and the trends in the movement. And uh, you're much more able to critique something and know where to go from here if mm -hmm. you look at that history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it certainly is the case that uh, you mentioned Trey Arrow here mm -hmm. in Portland uh, camping out on that uh, uh, ledge on the building mm -hmm. that the U.S. Forest Service occupies in downtown Portland. That was... Uh, such a high profile yeah. uh, action and I, I worked about a block away from there mm -hmm. uh, at that time and uh, everybody would go down to see what he was right. doing and, t and the, the conversation uh, and the awareness that this was an important issue was, uh, was just so heightened. Yeah, um, that was uh, around the peak of Earth First in Portland, and I'd like to see it come to a new peak. There's now some people out there in Portland trying to start a new Portland Earth First group. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, and um, you brought a couple of books with you. Yeah. Tell us about the books. Uh, well, this one is called Roadkill on the Highway of Love by Dennis Fritzinger, and I'd like to just read a brief sure. um, kind of amusing poem where he summarizes the principles of deep ecology. Deep Ecology, based on an eight-point platform developed by Arnie Ness and George Sessions. The well-being and flourishing, whale to plankton, moss to tree, has a value independent of its use to you or me. The richness and diversity of life forms, I might add, contributes to those values and are also values, Dad. This richness and diversity we humans have no right to reduce except for vital needs. Be sure you got that right. Human life and cultures could flourish were we far fewer, which is required for non-human life to flourish and endure. At present, humans interfere with non-human life too much, and the situation's rapidly worsening, which means we're out of touch. Policies must therefore be changed. No more must ide ideology drive or technology or the economy, but the need to keep life alive. From an ever-increasing standard of living informing our ideology, we must learn the difference between big and great and seek instead life quality. Those who subscribe to the foregoing points have an obligation to try to implement the necessary changes in our situation. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just thought that was a good way to present yeah. those principles. Uh, yeah, and one of the things I picked up from there is that um, you know we tend, to, we tend to be reductionist and we reduce the the full value of things to their economic value right. uh, and their use value. Mm -hmm. And we need to uh, see that there is a, there is a, uh, the value of the whole is much larger than the sum of the parts. Yeah, I'd hate to live in a world without nature even if I could. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And, and what, what's, what's your other book? Uh, this is Take Back Conservation by Dave Foreman. And while Dave Foreman uh, was the other side of a split within Earth First, there's still some very valuable things and inspirations he has to offer. And uh, this book is about how the mainstream 
uh, environmental movement is undercutting uh, true conservation and ecological principles of deep ecology and conservation biology. And he quotes in here Bob Marshall, who says, a small share of the American people have an overpowering longing to retire periodically from the encompassing clutch of a mechanistic civilization. To them, the enjoyment of solitude, complete independence, and the beauty of undefiled panoramas is absolutely essential to happiness. In the wilderness, they enjoy the most worthwhile, or perhaps the only worthwhile, part of life. So I just wanted to read that. And I'd recommend this book for just dissecting uh, what's wrong with the bigger mainstream groups that have gotten more and more corporate funded and resource extraction mm -hmm. oriented. Yeah. And that's Take, Take Back, Back Conservation. conservation. Okay. There's a few other books I'd like to recommend mm -hmm. as well, including um, the Conservation Biology Journal, Ghost Bears, which is a book about conservation biology. Um, uh, the Earth First Journal itself, which is an excellent way uh, to get involved with the movement, and uh, people can contact them through collective at earthfirstjournal.org or 561-249-2071. And they can also be reached at P.O. Box 964, Lake Worth, Florida, 33460. And by contacting the Earth First Journal, you can not only subscribe and find out what Earth Firsters are doing and about the issues involved, but also find their directory, which shows the group that might be nearest you. And if there isn't a group there, then start one. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to recommend that. Uh, there's also a book um, by E.O. Wilson called Biodiversity and a number of other resources like this. Okay, good. And some of those books might be listed on the website as well. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll we'll uh, put those book titles up mm -hmm. uh, when we broadcast the program. So, um, it just you know t talking about the the mainline environmental groups. I was just reading a few days ago that um, I can't remember what state it was in the Midwest uh, that the environmental groups and the energy uh, fracking industry had reached uh, some kind of an agreement. Mm -hmm. about safe practices uh, for fracking, mm -hmm. as if there could be such a yeah, thing. Yeah, there isn't such a thing <laughs> as far uh, as I know. Uh, yeah, but it just indicated to me what you're talking about is Definitely. the willingness of some of these mainline environmental groups to sell us out. Yeah, and I run into this all the time where, uh, for instance, I do forest activism in eastern Oregon trying to protect uh, forests on public lands over four national forests, and I run into environmentalists actually going to Washington, D.C. and lobbying for more logging. I'm not quite sure what happened to them mentally that they think this won't go a bad way with the industry and the Forest Service steering things. Mm -hmm. And uh, in collaborative groups, I run into environmentalists who are undercutting my more protective positions, and I can't quite fathom that either. I don't know whether it's funding driving their group or what, but it's definitely a problem these days. Right, yeah. So uh, you're the director uh, of the of Blue, Blue Mountains, Mountains Biodiversity, Biodiversity Project. Project. Talk yeah. just for a minute about that. Yeah, we monitor four national forests in eastern Oregon, and every summer we have a volunteer internship program where we invite people to come out and help us field check thousands of acres of proposed timber sale units. And we use the information from our survey sheets. We train people. They don't have to know anything when they come there and photographs to document evidence as our for our comments, our appeals, our negotiations with the Forest Service, and litigation if we actually have to sue on a particular timber sale. And we've had a pretty good track record, and uh, we're just an example of one of the many grassroots biodiversity protection groups that came out of the Earth First movement and was passionate about the land and spends a lot of time out there and stays closer to the issues, mm -hmm. so less compromising. Okay, all right, You're, and you said four, there, there's four uh, forests that are yeah. uh, included. Uh, the, how large acreage-wise? Uh, they're about? huge. Uh, it covers a good portion of Oregon. The mm -hmm. Umatilla, the Malheur, the Deschutes, and the Ochico National Forests are the ones we cover okay. usually. And those are in eastern, kind of southeastern Oregon? The Chutes is central Oregon central. and the others are more further east. Uh -huh. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, great. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Karen, for, thank you. for being here. I appreciate it's it. It's always a pleasure to be okay. with you. Good, good. All right, so we've been talking to um, 
Karen Coulter, who's founder and director of the Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project, and we've been talking about the Earth First movement. And so uh, to learn more about the Blue Mountain uh, Diversity, go to www.bluemountainsbiodiversityproject.org. So I want to call your attention to two upcoming events in Portland. Uh, first, the Progressive Radio Talk Show host Tom Hartman is going to be back in Portland for a public event on Friday, April 26th. Tom is author of over 25 books on a variety of topics. He is on equal protections, the rise of corporate dominance, and the theft of human rights is one of the most important books written on the history of the development of corporate power, and to my knowledge, the only one which addresses how free trade agreements are the most current effort by corporations to dominate decision making in both the United States and world worldwide. Tom is in Portland at the First Unitarian Church for a public presentation promoting the 28th Constitutional Amendment to end the corporate created, excuse me, the court created doctrines of corporate personhood and money is speech. The event starts at 7 p.m. The church is located at Southwest 12th and Main in downtown Portland. And if you live in Salem, Tom will be in Salem on Saturday, April 27th at 1 p.m. at the Grand Theater at 191 High Street Northeast in downtown Salem. The second event is brought to Portland by Move to Mend, the national group which advocates both for a democracy movement in the United States as well as a 28th constitutional amendment. They, they have organized a series of grassroots democracy convergences during 2013. One will be here in Portland during the weekend of May 3rd through May 5th. Location will be at Portland Community College Cascade Campus. More information and to register, go to movetomen.org slash 2013-convergences. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end a corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Learn more at our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or at Portland website at afd-pdx.org. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. Again, we want to thank Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, Tom Thomas, and Brad Leach. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.